So this is joint work with um, Ingemar and uh, the other Marcus. Um, and some other people, Mike Harrison, Gary McConnell, Steve Lemire, and Gene Kopp. Um, <clears throat> so we've published, posted one paper so far, which Ingemar commented on in his talk, and there are several others forthcoming. Um, okay, so the talk concerns some links between two important open problems. One is the seek problem, so we've had, I think, three talks on that so far, or is it two? Um, and the other is Hilbert's 12th problem, which I think, again, Ingemar already mentioned, there's gonna be some overlap between this talk and his talk, because we didn't confer in detail before. I hope not too much. Um, but anyway, it's the 12th problem, which Hilbert posed in 1900. And then in the late seven, in the second half of the 1970s, uh, Stark came up with a series of what are called the Stark conjectures, which are a proposed solution, one possible way of solving the problem. Very recently, oh, very recently, um, a solution has actually been found for piadic numbers. It actually appeared last year. But in its original formulation, as applied to complex numbers, the problem is still wide open. Um, <clears throat> The second problem is the seek existence problem. Um, so it's relevant to quantum information, which is how I originally got interested in it, uh, because to say that seeks exist is to make a statement about the geometry of quantum state space. Um, in particular, seeks describe a type of measurement which is in a certain sense tomographically optimal. And they also play a central role in the cubist interpretation of quantum mechanics. In addition to that, they're interesting to frame theorists and to people interested in classical signal processing. Um, and then it can be defined as a question concerning the existence of maximal sets of complex equiangular lines. On a more speculative note, and I really have no idea whether there's anything to this speculation because I haven't followed it up, but the function we now have, which you can use to actually calculate seats, well, it's appeared in the past, in the high energy physics literature, it's actually features in Louisville conformal field theory where it plays a kind of starring role. And it kind of leads one to wonder a bit if maybe there are some connections between seeks and algebraic number theory on the one hand and conformal field theory on the other. But that is totally speculative. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this talk is to not exactly explain in detail, I don't have the time for that but to um, sort of give some idea of how seek existence follows from the Stark, Stark conjectures together with a certain special function identity. Uh, we've tested the identity in numerous cases. So it seems very likely that it's true, but we haven't proven it. If we could prove it, then you could make the stronger statement. The Stark conjectures actually imply seek existence in every finite dimension which is somewhat remarkable because it's establishing a really very strong connection between two problems in completely different areas of mathematics, really. Algebraic number theory on the one hand and, well, the, the geometry of quantum state space on the other. I mean, there are various ways in which seeks arise. <clears throat> That's one of them. Um, there's also the possibility of the seek, I don't think the seeks imply the truth of the Stark conjectures. But it, I think it is already true that studying the seek problem has actually generated results in number theory. Um, I'll give a couple of examples of that later on. And I think there may well be more examples forthcoming. So these two problems are very intimately related. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to stress that Stark conjectures are not only relevant to the seek problem on a theoretical level, because they can potentially be used to prove seek existence. So it may be that when somebody eventually proves the Stark conjectures, they will thereby have proved seek existence. Um, but also on the level of practical numerics, um, because they can be used to actually calculate seeks. In this paper, which appeared <coughs> at the end of last year, and Ingemar's already mentioned this. 
we, that is actually the actual calculations were done by the other markers, uh, calculated a seek in dimension 39,000 odd. And that's an order of magnitude bigger than the highest dimension previously calculated using more conventional methods. Um, this does depend on the dimension being of a special form and various special assumptions. So I'm not saying we can just calculate any seek in dimensions that high using this method. But for dimensions of the stated kind, not only is algebraic number theory relevant, it actually provides the optimal method of doing a seek calculation in certain cases. Um, so it's a very sort of strong connection between number theory and physics. I find it quite surprising there are these connections. I mean, I started out with a prejudice that uh, it could, number theory couldn't be relevant to a problem like this. I mean, I got interested in number theory as a result of being interested in the seek problem. And, you know, it was fairly slow, my conversion, because I was thinking, well, how could it be relevant? And I just want to mention the reasons. Um, the point is that Hilbert's 12th problem, the Stark conjectures, concern algebraic number theory, for which there's all the difference in the world between an irrational number like root two and a rational approximation, no matter how accurate. Whereas by contrast, the seek problem is a problem of physics and the most precise physical measurement ever made, as I understand it, was to an accuracy of 15 significant figures. I got this from the British National Physical Laboratory. Uh, so I'm just relying on them. But anyway, as we all know, you don't get accuracies bigger, significantly bigger than that. So although physicists use notations like root two, that's really just because it's easier to write root two than it is to write out 15 digit decimal expansion, or at least that would be a natural assumption. So you would think that algebraic number theory can't be relevant to physics for that reason. There's another reason. Hilbert's 12th problem is specifically concerned with Galois automorphisms of number fields. Now, there's one Galois automorphism which every physicist is familiar with, and that's complex conjugation, which has the property that it respects addition and multiplication. You take the conjugate of a sum and you get the sum of the conjugates. You take the conjugate of a product and you get the product of the conjugates. And that's actually the defining feature of a Galois automorphism. A Galois automorphism is a map of a number field to itself, a bijection, which has this property. But in fact, complex conjugation, so far as I'm aware, and I think it must be, well, so far as I'm aware, it's the only Galois automorphism which widely features in the physics literature. If somebody knows of another example, please tell me. Why is that? Well, the answer is most best, the, the question is most easily answered by looking at an example. So, C is the complex numbers of the field generated over the real numbers by adding in the number i, as we already know. And it consists of all combinations of that form with a and b real. And complex conjugation takes that number to that number, as we all know. Now you can play exactly the same game with the field generated over the rationals by adding root two in. So it consists of all combinations like that where now A and B are rational numbers, not arbitrary real numbers. And then you can define sigma to be a map taking A plus B root two to A minus B root two. And that again is bijective and it respects addition and multiplication and therefore it is in fact a Galois automorphism. So from the point of view of pure mathematics, it's a perfectly good mapping. But from the point of view of physics, there are some problems. The first problem is that the field Q root two seems unmotivated. You can make a case for saying the only physically relevant numbers are rational numbers and one that should therefore do everything inside Q. Or if you're gonna adopt the convenience point of view, you could say, okay, I want to do lots of other things like some infinite series and so on. And I want to pretend that they have a solution. That is the series does converge to something. And so naturally you jump all the way to the complex numbers. There doesn't seem any point in sort of stopping halfway with a field like Q root two, which is convenient if you want to talk about root two, but not much else. Um, 
And the second problem is to do with continuity. If you take a sequence of rational numbers converging to root two, and it converges fast enough, then that number tends to zero, while the number you get by applying the Galois automorphism tends to infinity. So the mapping, the Galois automorphism is discontinuous at zero. It's actually discontinuous everywhere. It's quite easy to see that. And a function which is discontinuous at every point of its domain, you might intuitively feel, is not interesting physically. Um, so for these reasons, I thought originally, when I started getting interested in this, that I just felt quite resistant to the idea that this could be relevant to the problem. I think it undeniably is relevant. And I mean, the, um, the, the final sort of evidence for that is the fact you can actually directly use it to make calculations which you can't easily make any other way and they produce physically relevant numbers. So the reasoning is all wrong. In fact, Galois automorphisms are relevant to physics, certainly in the context of the seek problem. Um, <clears throat> and it raises a question actually, whether there are other instances. I mean, Galois theory applies to any problem defined by a set of polynomial equations, and there are lots of those in physics. And maybe, it just happens there's no other system of physically interesting polynomial equations where the Galois automorphisms are relevant. But maybe people just haven't looked in the hard enough out of a prejudice that they're not important. I should add that Galois automorphisms of a finite field do appear in physics problems, but I'm talking about an infinite field. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is really just summarizing stuff that other people have said already. And I just put it in, in case. Um, so the next few slides I'll spin through very fast. A seek, as I think everyone knows, is a system of D squared operators of that form, where the pi j's are rank one projectors, and their uh, trace of their products is like that. It's always one over D plus one unless j equals k. Um, I'm gonna forget the one over D. So for me, the set of op projectors pi one through to pi d squared is the seek. Um, geometrically, a seek is a d squared minus one dimensional regular simplex in quantum state space whose vertices are pure states. And you can see at once from this that it's kind of non-trivial to see that a seek exists therefore, because quantum state space is a d squared minus one dimensional convex body sitting inside a sphere. And the pure states, which is what the seek consists of, are the places where that meets the embedding sphere. But the pure states only have dimension 2d minus two, whereas the sphere is dimension d squared minus two. And those two numbers are equal when d equals two, but as soon as d is bigger than two, there is a big dimensional disparity. So it's easy to see you can fit a regular simplex into that blue sphere. It's not at all easy to see that you can fit it into the much lower dimensional um, manifold of pure states wandering through the sphere. And the seek, if seeks exist in every dimension, it's saying that is always possible and it is therefore making a geometrical statement about the structure of state space. I think it's better to look at it that way. You could say, okay, they're termographically optimal and they are, but the reason they're termographically optimal is exactly because they're a set of states maximally spread out. And if you think in terms of the geometry, that's the essential feature of a seek. And maybe, you know, that, that it's relevant to other uses of them as well. There are other features of a seek that are important. Uh, that the, 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 there is um, the possibility there's an infinite sequence of dimensions in which some of the seeks are what is called full spark, meaning you've got D squared vectors defining the projection operators, and every subset of D of them is linearly independent. And that is relevant for some of the applications, if it's true. Um, <clears throat> Is the construction possible? So Zauner originally conjectured that seeks exist in every finite dimension in the late 90s. 
And since then, an immense effort has gone into the problem of proving it. And during that time, seeks have been calculated in every dimension up to 193. I think that's the current state of play. And in many other dimensions, up to 39,604. So there's a lot of reason for thinking they exist in every dimension, but it's unproven. Um, and it's maybe not so surprising the problem is difficult because seek existence isn't actually equivalent to a Hilbert problem, but it's intimately bound up with one. And you might think that proving it is going to be of a similar order of difficulty. Um, <clears throat> every known seek has a group covariance property, which means the projectors are labeled by the elements of a finite group. And for each group element, there's a unitary UG such that if you do that, if you conjugate pi G dashed with UG, you get pi G G dashed. Um, and the group action is transitive, which basically means you can get every seek projector from any one of them by conjugating with the unitaries corresponding to the group. <clears throat> Um, and with a single exception of what are called the Hogar lines in dimension eight, um, every known seek is covariant with respect to the Weil Heisenberg group. Um, and in prime dimensions, it can actually be proved that if a seek has a group covariance at all, then it's necessarily covariant with respect to the Weil Heisenberg group. Um, <clears throat> so, definition of the Weil Heisenberg group. So, both Ingemar and um, Somebody else have talked about this, so I think I can just skip this, but it's defined by a, a shift operator and a phasing operator like that. Um, you have the displacement operators defined in this way. I should have put in a root of unity in front there, sorry. Um, and then um, the seat consists of those projectors. Um, Finally, seeks are naturally classified using the extended Clifford group, which is the set of unitaries or anti-unitaries that permute the displacement operators according to that relationship, where the dot means equal up to multiplication by a phase. And F is a two by two matrix such that the determinant is plus or minus one mod D. <clears throat> And the significance of the Clifford group is that if pi JK is a weil heisenberg seek and U is a Clifford unitary or anti-unitary, then conjugating, I should have put in a K there as well as a J, sorry. Um, conjugating the projector with the uh, element of the Clifford group gives you another weil heisenberg seek. And that means that the set of weil heisenberg seeks in a given dimension splits into orbits under the extended Clifford group. And with the exception of dimension three, which is special in many ways, and this is one of them, there are only a finite number of orbits in every dimension studied so far. Um, for example, in dimension four, there is a single orbit, which Scott and Grassel label 4A, in dimension seven, there are two orbits, 7a and 7b. In dimension 35, there are 10 orbits, and so on. And the first striking thing, which I think anyone interested in this problem has, there's a table in the paper by Marcus and Andrew Scott from back in 2009 or something, where it actually lists the number of orbits in each dimension up to. 50, or is it? Um, and I've just plotted out the number of orbits as a graph, and you can see they jump around, the number jumps around in a very, in a way that looks random and completely unpredictable. I mean, I spent ages trying to see a pattern in this and failed. Um, um, with what? Anything to do with primes? Or... No, no. As I say, the results I'm talking about here do actually explain it. Um, it's to do with properties of um, quadratic forms. Um, um, I won't be able to go, have time to go into the details, but I mean, we can, it's, it's completely predictable. 
as indicated by the next slide. So we can now actually easily calculate how many orbits there are in very big dimensions without, of course, calculating seeks. So that's just a randomly chosen biggish number. Uh, that's the 10 billionth prime, two to the fifth. Yeah, so, I mean, it's just to give an indication the fact you can calculate the number of orbits now. So I think we can say we, well, okay, this is all based on conjecture. It's based on the Stark conjectures and a conjectural special function identity we've not been able to prove. But I, I think that both conjectures are probably true and these numbers are true. I should stress we're specific, I'm gonna call them Stark seeks. They're not just Weil Heisenberg seeks, they're Weil Heisenberg seeks who owe their existence to the Stark conjectures. And maybe there are other non-Stark seeks in other dimensions, as happens in dimension eight. Maybe that happens in other dimensions too. But for this family of seeks, I think those numbers are pretty reliable. Uh, you can plot them out as well. So that's actually plotting the number of orbits against dimension out to 10 to the six. Um, and I, you can see at this stage that although that earlier picture where I just did it out to 50, you'd think it's fluctuating in a very random sort of way. And indeed it is, sort of, it looks random. Uh, there is a long-term trend as you can, is clear from this diagram. Um, <clears throat> you can also see that the numbers are very big, 10 to the five orbits. And these are number of orbits, not number of seeks. So for a long time, those of us interested in this problem wonder if there are dimensions where seeks don't happen, whether it's, you know, I mean, the fact that you can find them every dimension out to 50 or every dimension out to 190 or whatever, doesn't actually prove they exist. Th this doesn't prove they exist either somehow, but it makes me personally feel subjectively very confident that they are actually there in every dimension. And not just some, a handful, but in fact, a lot. I mean, those are big numbers, 10 to the five. Another prominent feature of the seeks we've been able to calculate, that basically means the seeks that Marcus and Andrew have been able to calculate with a few exceptions, um, is that there exists, uh, always seems to exist a Clifford unitary or anti-unitary U with this property. That means basically the corresponding vector is an eigenvector of that Clifford unitary stroke anti-unitary. And we refer to U as a symmetry of the seek. And you find empirically, again, um, Scott and Grassel have, um, have tabulated the symmetries of all the seeks they've calculated. And just as if you look at the number of orbits in each dimension, that seems to jump around all over the place in a very unpredictable way. So the orders of the symmetry group seem to jump around, but there are certain features which jump out at you. One is that the symmetry group is always cyclic. So, and the second is the order is always a multiple of three, a multiple not equal to zero, by the way, I should say, not this. Yes. Yeah, no, no, a multiple of three. In some cases, but not others, it contains anti-unitaries as well as unitaries. One also finds empirically that every orbit contains a fiducial for which the symmetry group contains a unitary corresponding to one of the two matrices FZ or FA. Um, and depending on which of these cases applies, we say the orbit is type FZ or type FA. Z is for Zauner. I mean, it was Zauner who first noticed the importance of this matrix and its conjugates. And one finds that for every dimension, there's at least one FZ orbit. And if the dimension is equal to three mod nine, but not otherwise, then there is also at least one FA orbit. So it's never the case that they're all FA, but if the dimension is equal to three mod nine, some of them are FA, or at least that's what the observations suggest. And the resulting picture is actually quite complicated. So this is the situation in dimension 48, where you have seven orbits. The order of the symmetry groups is 24 for one of them, six for one of them, and then three for five of them. So they're mostly order three. 
but you get these exceptional cases where the order is bigger. One of them has an anti-unitary symmetry, the other six do not. And then the one with the biggest order symmetry is FA, next biggest is FZ, and then you have a solitary FA and four FZ orbits. And you know, if you look at those tables, and I have quite extensively, um, you think, well, where on earth is this coming from? But with the results I'm talking about here, you can actually project all of this too. Uh, they're all just straightforward consequences of the Stark conjectures plus the special function identity. And you can use the conjectures to actually calculate the group generators. Um, Bolson Waldron have suggested that one might also, even should also, get FA orbits in some dimensions equal to 6 mod 9. The phenomenon shouldn't be confined to 3 mod 9. And again, you can understand from this that no such seeks have ever been observed. And it follows from our conjectures just why it doesn't happen. Um, so we can explain a lot. We, we can use them to actually calculate seeks. We can also use them to kind of calculate and predict the seek phenomenology, as it might be called. Okay, so that was about seeks. And it was based, you know, I've basically been listing some of the empirical observations, as you might call them, and then explaining how they're predictable. I now want to talk about the number theory. Um, <clears throat> so, um, you need to be a little bit careful here because the matrix elements of a projector pi depend on the basis. So you can actually shift the basis with the, an appropriate unity and you'll turn an object whose components, matrix elements are all algebraic numbers into one whose matrix elements are all transcendental. Um, so I'm actually assuming that we're working in the standard basis, i.e. the basis in which the WH the displacement operators are defined in the way I defined them earlier. I'm also excluding from consideration dimensions two and three, which have some special properties. So I'm assuming that dimension is four or larger. Um, and the, what started this line of investigation was the observation looking at solutions calculated by Marcus and Andrew Scott um, that the components of the seek projectors are all in fact expressible in radicals. That is, they can be written as combinations of nested roots. Unbelievably complicated combinations, I would like to stress. So Ingemar put up on one of his slides uh, a picture of the seek in components in dimension six, and those look like some quite nasty numbers, as he said. Um, and when I saw that paper, indeed, I thought, Ugh. And it gets steadily worse as the dimension goes up. So, you know, the files containing these things are many megabytes. And to look at them is off-putting to say the least. Um, but they do all have this property that they're all expressible in terms of radicals. Um, and that immediately tells you that there's something special at the field they generate is of a very special kind. Um, I just want need to define a few concepts. So let F E be a pair of fields such that F is a subfield of E. And that's usually written by writing E stroke F. So just writing E stroke F means E, F is a subfield of E. Um, it's easily seen that E satisfies the axioms for a vector space over F. So it has a dimension. And that dimension is in fact confusingly called the degree. Um, <clears throat> the Galois group, I've already explained what a Galois automorphism is. It's something that respects the operations of addition and multiplication is denoted like that. The extension is said to be normal if the order of the group is the same as the degree of the extension. And finally, we say the extension is abelian if the Galois group is abelian. So that's just some terminology I'll be using. And then we have this fundamental theorem, which in essence was proved by Galois. He didn't use the language of fields, but that's what it comes to. Um, 
A field is generated by radicals if it can only if it can be built as a tower like this. So you start with F0, which is the rationals, you end with Fm, which is the field of interest. You have a sequence of subfields with the properties that each successive extension is normal, order of Galois group equals degree of field extension, and the group itself is abelian. Um, and this is basically how Galois proved his celebrated theorem that polynomial equations of degree bigger than or equal to five cannot in general be solved in radicals. Um, <clears throat> the fact that seeks are expressible in radicals tells us that the field they generate must be constructible as a tar of the kind I've just shown. And the obvious question that provokes is, how big is the tar? Is there anything systematic you can say about it? Is it always of a given height? And if so, what is the height? And if you had any experience working with seek projectors, you would tend to assume that because the numbers are horrible, there's a, I'm not gonna mention him by name, but there's a colleague who, who once remarked that a problem which produces numbers like this can't be interesting. I mean, I think you know who that was, don't you? <laughs> you know who that was, don't you? Oh, I may be getting it wrong, actually. No, it wasn't you. No, I mean, I exactly. I mean, I think a lot of people have felt this. Um, you, you really need to work with these things to have a deep emotional repugnance, actually, for the numbers. Um, I mean, they're really hideous. Um, so you would think, certainly it's what I thought originally, that, okay, horrible numbers. So the tower is going to be horrible too, sort of millions of fields long or something. But in fact, the absolute opposite is the case. It's remarkably simple. It's fact, it's as short as it can be without the field actually being abelian. It's of this type, Q, subfield of Q root capital D. Capital D is the square free part of this number, which Ingemar in his talk said crops up everywhere. And indeed it's because it generates this base field. And then a field sitting over that, which is always a normal abelian extension of Q of root D. So the tar is height two, which is as small as it can be without the field actually being abelian over Q. The intermediate field is degree two, which is as low as it can be without E being abelian over Q. And what's more, we have an ansatz for a generator of the intermediate field, namely the number root D, which seems always to work. So out of those horrible numbers, you get this remarkably simple picture. And it was really a big surprise at least to me. But also it doesn't end there. Um, <clears throat> e isn't just any Arbelian extension of Q root D, it's a very remarkable one. And to understand why we need to review some number theory. So Arbelian extensions, Arbelian extensions of other fields have been the focus of an enormous amount of work over the last 150 years. And in fact, they're the subject of Hilbert's 12th problem. So there's a lot known about them, short of us, the fact that we still can't prove Hilbert's 12th problem. Solve it. <clears throat> Kronecker started this line of investigation back in the 19th century by asking what's the general form of an Arbelian extension of the rationals. And the answer is the kronecker weber theorem, which is so called because he stated an inadequate version of it, an inadequate proof of it, somewhere around 1850, 1860, I'm not sure the exact date. And then the final proof came 30 or 40 years later, I forget the dates. I'm just saying this because it's not an easy theorem. Um, but what it says is, a, it's a very remarkable result. A finite degree field is abelian over the rationals, if and only if it's a subfield of a field generated by a root of unity. So these are called cyclotomic fields and they play a very, very central role if you're interested in our Beeling extensions of rations. It's a, it's a beautiful result, actually. I mean, and quite surprising. Um, <clears throat> having thought about that, Kronika then thought about generalizing the result. Suppose we have a tar of this form and let that be the Galois group of L over K 
And the question then is for which given K, can we fully characterize the set of fields for which that's abelian? Can we characterize the abelian extensions of K for a given K? And Kronika kind of made a start on this problem by, by making the initial moves in what eventually led to the theorem resulting abelian extensions of imaginary quadratic fields, fields of this form generated by i times the square root of a positive integer. Um, and using this theory, you can show that such field extensions are abelian if and only if they're subfields of a field generated by the torsion points of a certain kind of elliptic curve. Or to put it another way, the root, the, it's a field where instead of being generated by roots of unity, it's generated by special values of elliptic functions. And Hilbert described this characterization of abelian extensions of imaginary quadratic fields as, quote, not only the most beautiful part of mathematics, but also of all science, which is a bit over the top, possibly, but he, it, clearly, uh, it, it clearly gave him a buzz. And his 12th problem asks for the generalization. Can you do it for things other than real qu imaginary quadratic fields? And as I said earlier, a version applying to Piadic number fields has recently been proven just last year. Um, but in its original formulation, it remains open. And the obvious place to start is exactly the fields we're getting in the seat problem, abelian extensions of a real quadratic field. So to solve the problem for a real quadratic field, you need to do two things. You need to identify the analogs of these fields. So those are the fields that feature in the Kronecker Weber theorem. And you need to identify the transcendental function e to the x. And the first problem has been solved in a manner of speaking. So if you ask magma to do it, or various other algebraic, various other programs that do this sort of calculation, it'll produce a set of generators the, this, the analog of this field, but it'll produce horrible generators usually. Um, and it'll take a long time to do it usually. It, um, but what we don't know in general is the analog of the function e to the x. And that's really needed um, because it gives you a nice description of the field and it gives you a nice description of the Galois group as well. Um, now, the fields that you can get from a program like magma are called Ray class fields, and the analog of the integer n is called the conductor. And as I say, you can get them without actually knowing the analog of e to the x. Um, so here's another remarkable fact. In every case examined, seeks generate Ray class fields. So they're not just generating this remarkably simple structure, an abelian extension of Q of root D, but they're specifically generating Ray class fields. Um, let's go into this a bit more detail. In any given dimension, there's typically more than one extended Clifford orbit of seeks, as I've already said. The orbits are grouped into multiplets, collections of orbits corresponding to the same number field. And it turns out that the fields associated to different multiplets form a lattice under field inclusion. And the field has unique minimal and maximal elements with all other fields being intermediate between the, these two. So that's quite a lot to take in. Here's a diagram. The situation in dimension 35, you have the minimal seek, which is 35J in the scott Grassel classification scheme, the maximal multiplet, which consists of four orbits, B, C, D, and G, and then these other intermediate orbits or multiples or fields, and the integers are the extension degrees. Um, now, what you find, in fact, is that the minimal multiplet, the minimal field in each dimension, is what has always traditionally been regarded as a Ray class field. And this forthcoming work by Scott and Ligarius, that actually the other orbits generate Ray class fields in some suitably generalized sense. So this is one way in which the seek problem has already led 
to some results in algebraic number theory. I mean, it's not that I, they could have done it anyway, but as it happens, it was thinking about this problem, which motivated them to generalize the notion of a ray class field. Um, <clears throat> okay. So as I've said, the focus of this talk, okay, I've already said this, and I'm running out of time. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, sorry, as I, as I said, just being able to calculate the field, I'm now coming onto the start conjectures. So being able to calculate the ray class field over a given real quadratic field only takes us so far. It gives us field generators, which are sort of fairly random and are typically ugly and difficult to work with. And the corresponding description of the Galois group is a pain in the neck as anyone who's tried to work it out knows. Um, um, <clears throat> whereas if you take the, I'll go back to the case of a cyclotomic field, you can calculate roots of unity very quickly and easily. Um, and the action of the Galois group couldn't really be simpler. It takes a root of unity like that to one like that, where m is an integer co-prime to n. So you've got a very simple description of the Galois group. And what you want is something, and something similar is true for the description of abelian extensions of imaginary quadratic fields using elliptic functions. What we would like is something that will do this for abelian extensions of um, <clears throat> real quadratic fields. And so the problem basically, the remaining part of the problem is to find analogs of e to the two pi i over n, roots of unity. And the star conjectures are one potential solution to the problem. If they're correct, then ray class fields are generated by special values of an L function, which is a generalization of the Riemann zeta function. I'm not going to write it down. I don't have the time. And there are things that, that need to be explained just to understand it. That's actually why they're not as satisfactory as they might be, because you can write down the par series expansion for e to the x quickly and easily, and you don't need to know any number theory. But if you want to write down the par series expansion for an L function, you need to know quite a lot of algebraic number theory. However, if true, it would give us most, if not all, of what Hilbert was asking for. So going back to Seeks, we've seen that it, it amazingly turns out that Seeks generalize ray class, generate ray class fields. What is perhaps even more amazing is they produce the start units too. Um, and it works the other way. You can use start units to calculate Seeks. So they're really intimately connected with the problem. Um, to see the way this works, let pi be a seek fiducial vector, define that object, they're called the overlaps, they have satisfied that relation and this relation, um, and um, you find that if now let E be the ray class field corresponding to the seek projector, sigma an element of the Galois group. If sigma fixes root D, then the conjugates, the action of sigma on the overlaps produces the overlaps for another seek fiducial, possibly the same seek fiducial. But if sigma flips the sign of root D, then the numbers are not the overlaps of any seek fiducial. We refer to them instead as ghost overlaps. And it turns out, as Ingemar has already said, that they are in fact square roots of start units for the field E. And that gives us a method for calculating seeks. You first calculate the start units using an L function. You then calculate their square roots complete with the correct sign, so that's non-trivial, to obtain the ghost overlaps. You then apply an automorphism flipping the sign of root D. You then get the seek overlaps and then use the seek overlaps to calculate the seek. Having said all that, it's easiest. That, that's a very, very broad summary. Anyway, it's um, not totally ideal. Um, I mentioned earlier that one needs to know some algebraic number theory to write down and calculate an L function. 
Uh, the L function approach has the further disadvantage that it doesn't give us the ghost overlaps directly, but rather their squares. One can get around this problem by working with a different function, which we call the Shintani Fadiev modular co-cycle. I won't bother with explaining what modular co-cycle is because I really have run out of time. Shintani was a number theorist who proposed something called the double sign function back in the 70s because I don't think he actually knew about the Stark conjectures. So he was tackling the same problem in ignorance of Stark. And it was rediscovered by Fadiev in the 90s who was interested in conformal field theory and he called it the quantum dialogarithm. So to honor both those people, we call it the Shintani Fadiev modular co-cycle. It's actually a generalization of those things. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just briefly indicate how it's defined. You take that object, which is defined, converges whenever the absolute value of Q is less than one. You replace Z with E to the two pi I X, Q with E to the two pi I T, we denote it like that. You then define this thing, and that is the Shintani Fadiev co-cycle. And although defined on the assumption the imaginary part of tau is bigger than zero, otherwise that product is divergent, it analytically continues to the lower half plane. So you put in, you continue it onto the real line, you put in the appropriate number, multiply by the appropriate root of unity, and you have ghost seek overlaps. And the reason I want to stress all that is you can see that unlike L functions, you don't actually need any number theory to calculate these things. Um, they're, they're, they're rather, it's a bit more complicated than defining e to the x, but it's an ordinary analytic function we're talking about. And it can be handled by the usual methods. I would stress number theory still comes into it because what these things give us is ghost overlaps. So to get actual overlaps, you have to first of all, in principle, exactify them, which isn't easy. And then you have to apply Galois automorphism. If you didn't have to do that, you can get it much more quickly. Anyway, that's en enough for my talk. <clears throat>